And there are also people who uh, lived through a childhood of immense uh, inundation and in, uh, uh, visual propaganda, you know, the number of hours that they were brought up watching television and so on. All that's fairly significant really change from a early generation. So it's possible that there's some differences, but my strong suspicion is that it's kind of more story than just the, uh, uh, the techniques of propaganda are much more advanced in the mind of the things that it's created. And the need to divert people is much beyond what it used to be. Well, that was some rock way to Iris. <laughs> Comedy, get real. Yeah. <laughs> Want me to disregard the camera and talk to you? Yeah, sure. More or less. Yeah. Okay. Hi, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Jay, and I'll be your bartender. And uh, my name is B. I'll be your editor. And Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky, the uh, uh, who's in town here to, to speak with us. And, and uh, while he's here, he's also going to speak, be speaking at the audio auditorium. But he came to see us. I teach at MIT. I work on. Uh, language, philosophy, uh, cognitive psychology. A uh, large part of my life is devoted to uh, what's called politics. So. Yeah, well, I think we should, I think we should uh, introduce the show out here. Okay. Um, just because I thought that uh, that what, what happened in the studio was kind of um, uh, lame. Okay. So. So hello and welcome to Jay and B on the Rocks. I'm Jay and I'm the bartender of this program. Yeah, and my name's B. Uh, I actually edit things, and, and that's why I'm able to just um, oh snap my fingers, say, and cause you'll see something else. Yeah. Because she's a bitch. She's a bitch. She's a bitch. She's 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 a bitch. Any any number of bodily noises can be used to segue to something. For example, um, well, Noam Chomsky, for example, uh, uses this uh, this cough of his. <laughs> I've had this thing for three months to get rid of it. I'm interested in a theory that you have called the propaganda model, and I was wondering if you could explain what that is. Yeah, I wouldn't actually dignify it with the name theory. It's more like a truism, uh, like almost everything in the social sciences. There's what are sometimes called the agenda-setting media, the ones who set the framework that others adhere to. And they're the ones with the big resources and the big outreach and so on. Uh, and then there's the, uh, the general medias, um, local newspapers, uh, television, and so on. Much of what they do is sort of diversion. Uh, they keep people out of trouble, you know, sort of pay attention to something that doesn't matter. Uh, the agenda-setting media are aimed, especially journals like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and so on, at uh, the sort of decision-making sectors, you know, educated sectors, what's sometimes called the political class. Uh, so the agenda-setting media kind of set the framework, and what else kind of adheres to it. Uh, so the local Bloomington newspaper, whatever it is, doesn't have reporters all over the world and news bureaus and so on and without looking at it I can you can obviously predict that it's going to pick up its uh, decisions as to what's the story of the day mm -hmm. from what came across on the AP wire. So anyway, the, um, there's the mainstream media, there's the, well, what Chomsky talked about the general media and the agenda setting media. Okay, the agenda setting media are kind of up here, right? And they um, set the agenda the general media is kind of underneath and they just follow the agenda and then under that there's the alternative media kind of is doing their own thing but no one's really paying too much attention and then under that is JMB on the rocks <laughs> this TV show that you're watching now not only is no one paying any attention but even we don't know what we're talking about there's a difference between this program and the New York Times uh, but if we break <laughs> minor, but, minor yeah. but you know they're kind of relatively insignificant yeah. in comparison right, to exactly. their influence. But they are huge corporations, parts of even bigger ones, very profitable ones. Uh, they, like other corporations, they have a product and a market. Uh, the market is other big businesses, namely advertisers, which okay. keeps them going. Uh, the product is audiences, and in their case, fairly privileged audiences. I'd like to show you something that I think Jay has sitting yeah. over there. 
This is an ad from uh, the broadcast and mm -hmm. TV, which is a, it's a magazine which is uh, selling TV shows to um, different stations, trying to get them yeah. to pick it up. And That's I, right. I want to call you. Yeah. Now, this is a particular show called Time to Generate. Mm -hmm. um, which is targeted to Generation X. That's why the X is so big in, I see. in the next generation. And I would call your attention especially to, to um, where is it? The, uh, oh, they're the 18 to 34 demographic that advertisers, advertisers are buying. Um, yeah, and that exactly seems strange right. when, I, when I read that. I mean, how can... Uh, that's exactly right. How, yeah. can, how can you buy a demographic? Will you buy people. I mean, what the media sell is audiences. That's their product. And advertisers buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's exactly the correct description. Yeah. Okay, but but that almost makes it sound like they're not that they're in the paying. Um, they are. I mean, they're paying the producer for the product. Right. So, like, if you're whoever you know is producing a whatever I don't know what they're selling, but let's say it's a sitcom on television, mm -hmm. uh, somebody's producing it. They've got a product. I mean, the uh, the product that they're in fact, I mean, they're, they're actually making the sitcom, mm -hmm. but what they're selling to the advertiser is not the sitcom. They're selling the watchers. Yeah, right. And they're selling the audience to the advertisers who are buying the audience, in effect, mm -hmm. and paying the guy who produced it some advertising mm -hmm. fee. So their terminology is quite accurate. Yeah, and it seems like a very simple, common sense thing, but I think that most, most people don't um, see well, it that way. Well, it is it, it shocked me. Really. I mean, look, take, take say, television. I mean, the, the guys who, uh, CBS doesn't make any money when you turn the tube on. Mm -hmm. They don't yeah. get anything out of it. Right. What they get money from is if somebody's giving them advertising revenue. So the propaganda model simply suggests the truism, namely that uh, the media product should reflect its institutional nature. That is, mm -hmm. it should reflect the, you'd expect it to reflect the uh, interests and concerns of the business community, primarily big business. So, government, which is closely linked to the corporate interests, uh, and other power centers. It's not about a deep, profound, philosophical conversation. It's just about fun. It's about relationships. So what about this Noam Chomsky guy? Um, he's a character. Hey, Jenny Beasley. Hi. Why don't you transition for us into this next scene? Okay. Relationships. What? Relationships. For example, our relationship to you, you, the camera operator, Chris Marin, in fact. If you turn yeah. the camera around, Chris, you'll be able to uh, see yourself. See yourself. You want to in the lens. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Wow. Yeah. So here I am right here. I'm the camera guy right now. Yeah. Having a great time. Yeah. And uh, they're really, the necessary illusions are everywhere. Just look around you and wonder what could have been if it wasn't this way right now. Necessary illusions. This is something that uh, Noam Chomsky talks about a lot. I'm not sure if he mentioned it really in our interview, but I, th I think maybe I did accidentally. So, um, what I, what, and there are certain necessary illusions that the government or the ruling class has must to maintain. maintain in the minds of the um, people yeah. in order to um, continue fucking them up the ass as they do. Yeah, like the illusion that, that the American government has any uh, s uh, reason to be the only government, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, th there's been an increasing federalization of, uh, of our government. Um, there's less local control these days than there, than there has been in the past. And as a result, um, people are, are under the control of, of a distant ruling class in, in Washington, D.C. that has very little to do with them. It's important for people not to think about that. Well, I want to talk about welfare. So, you know, big problem, deficit, you know, giving too much money to, you know, mothers to spend their children and so on. There's another whole welfare system that nobody ever talks about. Uh, the, the, uh, and that's the, uh, uh, the fiscal measures, mm -hmm. which essentially give you tax, sorry, tax deductions for various expenditures. So let's say home mortgage loans get tax deduction or business expenses, you know, you take your colleagues out to lunch or charitable expenditures, the whole mass of stuff which are by fiscal measures reduce your taxes. Well that's the exact equivalent of welfare payments. Mm -hmm. Exact equivalent. I mean it's no difference if you you know if you take a hundred dollars if a guy doesn't pay a hundred dollars in taxes, 
that's exactly the same as making me pay everything and giving them $100 because yeah. that's the same. Yeah. Uh, but, so there's a huge welfare state, mm -hmm. sometimes called the hidden welfare state, goes overwhelmingly to the wealthy. Mm -hmm. You know, what you have to think about is the mother with dependent children. You're not supposed to think about the executive who's ripping you off in the other, mm -hmm. some other fashion. Well, that's the same kind of thing, except that mm -hmm. the welfare state for the rich is much more extensive. I mean, take, say, uh, the, the health thing, the other big issue. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's one very striking property of the, all the plans mm -hmm. that are being considered, two striking properties, Clinton, Cooper, mm -hmm. everybody else. Uh, one is, and this is being discussed to a certain extent, that they vest authority in the hands of huge insurance companies. Mm -hmm. uh, the other is that they, uh, the other factor, which nobody talks about, is that they're radically regressive. So if you have, say, a tax-based system mm -hmm. like Canada, it's as progressive as the tax system is. Mm -hmm. You know, the richer you are, the mm -hmm. more you pay. Uh, all of these systems are f regressive. So you're the chairman of the right. board of General Motors, and you and the secretary and the janitor all, in effect, pay the same amount for health care. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's even worse than that. Uh, we, that's not heard of. That's as if everybody paid the same amount of taxes. But well, you know, as a tax system, that would be outlandish. Mm -hmm. uh, but this topic is never discussed. I mean, you try to find a word about it. Yeah. Well, same sort of story. You don't want people to think about the things that matter to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a couple of ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. One is to tell them morality plays about figure skating, mm -hmm. or to watch the Super Bowl, or something or other. Just divert them, in other mm -hmm. words. That's one way. Uh, the other way is to uh, shape the discussion mm -hmm. and uh, 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 presentation of issues so people just don't see it. There has been a very significant indoctrination campaign since the Vietnam War, since the 60s. I mean, the 60s were a period of sort of breakdown of controls, and it scared people. This is a periodic thing in American history. Yeah. There was nothing new about it. You know, every time there has been public ferment, there has been a major attempt to drive people back into their hole. Well, you know, the 60s began to it developed again, and then came the inevitable effort to uh, repress, and it's been less successful. So there's much more, uh, mm -hmm. I think, probably the activist movements have grown since the 60s. So there was an article that I read somewhere recently, uh, an interview with you, where you uh, argued that uh, the Gulf War was, in a sense, um, a success for the peace movement. Why did you say that? Well, well, it's the first time in history that I know of that there were huge demonstrations against the war before the war broke out. Mm -hmm. Compare it with Vietnam. In the case of the uh, Gulf War, it, it was before the bombing. Mm -hmm. That's never happened before. Mm -hmm. We kind of wanted to shift gears and, and talk a little bit about the drug war, mm -hmm. um, which is, in essence, a war of the government against its own people. Right. Why is this war being waged? I think it was one of the techniques of social control. It was the, the drug war that Bush launched in 1989 was not the first. There were mm -hmm. several. And if you look at them, they're always, I think, they're always timed uh, with relation to issues of social control. So take the 1989 one. Was there some new crisis in drugs? No, on the contrary. Among, in fact, hard drug use had been declining. And part of the reason why they could... Uh, launch the drug war and expect favorable results was that, it, that if the tendencies continued, they'd be able to say two years mm -hmm. later, well, you know, look at the figures, see what great things we did. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no new crisis in 1989, but there, there was another crisis, namely uh, the uh, Soviet Union was collapsing. Mm -hmm. Now, the major technique of social control for you know, a long time, in fact, since the First World War, had been, you know, economists had come in. Well, it's yeah. getting very hard to say that. <laughs> Bush's uh, speech announcing the drug war was in early September. Mm -hmm. And at the time of his speech, uh, public opinion studies showed that drugs were, the concern over drugs was way down. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, if you looked at the, I forget the numbers now, but if you looked at the range of issues, it was quite low. Mm -hmm. uh, within about two or three weeks, it had zoomed to a yeah. parallel level and all that stuff. And the, measures undertaken in the drug war had nothing to do with reducing drugs. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you try to reduce drugs, what you'd go after is, first of all, tobacco, and second of all, alcohol, which are the biggest killers by a long shot. Mm -hmm. Take, say, marijuana and, uh, you know, crack. Mm -hmm. Well, marijuana was, you know, has been the main target of mm -hmm. the 
drug war, you know, repression. And mm -hmm. it's, but it's, I'm sure it's not good for you, but it's not terribly harmful. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't think there's a single uh, overdose known after right. tens of millions of users. Mm -hmm. And then why is tobacco legal and marijuana illegal? Mm -hmm. Tobacco is much more harmful. Mm -hmm. My guess is that tobacco is a basically an industrial crop. You can make mm -hmm. money on it. Right. Whereas marijuana, you can grow in your backyard, but you can make any money on it. But on the other hand, when you, when you knock out the less harmful mm -hmm. drugs, like marijuana, mm -hmm. you just drive people to the more harmful mm -hmm. ones, to the industrial product. You know, the, the op, if you really want to stop drug, you know, mm -hmm. the drug, whole drug industry, the mm -hmm. thing you would target is, first of all, the banks, uh, which are doing the money laundering, mm -hmm. and then just, you know, the chemical corporations. I mean, U.S. chemical corporations, the DEA has pointed out over and over again, they're ship, shipping to Latin America chemicals mm -hmm. way in excess of any industrial use, mm -hmm. and exactly the chemicals that go into drug production. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Have you heard of any Delta Force uh, operations taking over the executive suite to, you know, American Lily. Adam, uh, Yeah, no, of course not. Uh, have you ever had a psychedelic experience yourself? No, mm -hmm. very square. Okay. I must be one of the few people who's never smoked pot. <laughs> okay. So we've come out here to Cedar, Cedar Bluff outside of Bloomington. Um, because it's such a beautiful day, and you know, uh, we're rebel. We're all taking the day off. We've decided to say fuck it to our jobs, and uh, drink some beer on Cedar Bluff, because you know it's important to have daily acts of rebellion in your life. Um, I think Chomsky kind of implied that, and uh, and so do we. Every day. Well, actually, today's Saturday, and. I don't work on Saturday, so... And Joe doesn't have a yeah, job. I don't have a job, actually. I'm unemployed. So but I'm rebelling what a against rebel. my unemployment. What rebels we all are. Yeah, yeah. Cedar Bluff, one of nature's many wonders here in Indiana. You see it there behind me. What? This bluff? Is this... Are we in the bluff yet? No, no, we're headed towards the bluff. We're, headed we're in the bluff the area. Bluff. Now, how did they decide to call it Cedar Bluff? Uh, probably from the cedar trees. Really? I don't see any. So who well, was the, there yet. Who was the person? Oh, okay. who? The sun is back. Cool. Wow, it must be spring coming on. Yeah. You can see it. It's very bright. Wow, that must it's be almost, why you can't open your eyes. It's almost intoxicating. Yeah. Just look at this wonderland back there, because as you look with the light, so we've been walking mm -hmm. against them, as you look backwards and you go and pick up all the Wow, yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of our roles, really, in this in this program here. Yours and B and me and all these other people that we're hanging out with. To just show light. Just kind of guide people along through this uh, otherwise incomprehensible mess. Oh, it's very comprehensible. Oh, that, yeah. But not if you've been drinking. <laughs> Carry the boot against the man. Carry the boot against the man. Carry the boot. Against the man, carry the boot. Against the man. Carry the boot. Carry the boot. Carry the carry the. Look at this right here. This is pretty cool, I think. Oh yeah, man. Fuck the revolutionary songs. Look at this. Instant gratification. J and B on the rocks. J and B at the, the bluffs, Cedar Bluff, in fact, here in uh, outside of Bloomington. It's on the southwest side of Bloomington. It's a really cool place to come, and it's a lovely day here in Southern Indiana. So, what about this Noam Chomsky guy? Um, he's a character in the film uh, Manufacturing Consent. Um, you say, and this is a quote: "An attack on the fundamental structure of state capitalism is in order." Why do you believe this, and, and how would such an attack? Why do I believe? I, I think there's a fundamentally wrong with state capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's an authoritarian system with absolutist institutions mm -hmm. that are immune to public control, and I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that every institution should be under public democratic control, and that includes the central institutions mm -hmm. of society. Uh, furthermore, if these a corporation is a fascist mm -hmm. system, basically, I mean, you can. You know, the structure of power within it is strictly top-down. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're outside it, you can knit yourself to it or not, mm -hmm. you know, and starve. Uh, but yeah, and if you have nothing to say about it, yeah. you know, like, and if you're not part of it, you can do nothing, you know. It's, it's pure absolutism. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, traditional classical liberals were opposed to corporations. Joint stock companies are denounced by Adam Smith and Thomas Jefferson, who lived long enough to see the beginnings of 
the modern corporate system was appalled by it mm -hmm. because these are just absolute systems of power. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were given their power by the courts. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever voted for it. You know, there was a change in the legal structure in the 19th century, mm -hmm. which vested more and more power and authority and mm -hmm. supremacy in these systems of absolute power. Either you give in, mm -hmm. and you say, okay, you know, those guys will run my life, mm -hmm. and our life will decline, mm -hmm. which is what's happened. Uh, or what a lot of people are doing is you join some uh, fanatic cult, neo-Nazis or fundamentalist mm -hmm. religions or something, it's kind of an irrational but mm -hmm. understandable answer. Uh, or you mm -hmm. try to move towards really radical change in the system of oppression. Mm -hmm. There's no magic formula. I mean, you have, you have to begin with the self-education, mm -hmm. which usually means working with others, because mm -hmm. you know, no individual sitting alone somewhere can figure out what's going on, you know, mm -hmm. the resources, the time, or anything else. So it requires organization, education, mm -hmm. uh, uh, political action, uh, uh, if you can get to the right scale, dismantling mm -hmm. the progressive structures. That's been done successfully in some areas of mm -hmm. the United States. There's been an attack on lots of structures of mm -hmm. domination and authority. And the feminist movement, or the mm -hmm. uh, gay and lesbian movement, or the civil rights movements, mm -hmm. or the multicultural movements, or feminine environmental movements, which are essentially protecting the rights of future generations. Right. But they've never gotten to the core. Mm -hmm. uh, which is the uh, system of control over uh, production, uh, mm -hmm. distribution, uh, you know, investment, yeah. uh, capital, essentially. Until you get to the core, uh, these other tendencies are just going to continue. Do you have a favorite mixed drink? Mixed drink. <laughs> <laughs> I like my bourbon straight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> from the profound to the stupid, so in but a breath. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Oh my God, it's the tree man with his big scary eyes. But Jenny Beasley will save me. She has come to save me from the tree man and well, I just feel very happy about that. Here, I'll get you some moss. It's just so soft and green, look at that. And I can't remember if I heard it when I was young or if it's true that, that women used to use this as maxi pads. And I was thinking it sure would be soft, but what about the bugs? Didn't they crawl up and oh, the bugs use it too. But I've got a bigger stick! <laughs> <laughs> As I sit here in my little nature's hippie cushion, or what have you, Hey, what's that in your hand? I've got a lens for you. Oh, thanks. It's my favorite. <laughs> oh, put it over the, the lens and we'll see what it does. Okay. Jay, I just found something for Oh, look, it's you. You know, I think if Chomsky sat in this thing and his audience were up in the bluff, maybe he'd have more success. But he would have to be reclining. Well, we were thinking it'd be nice if Bloomington was able to free itself from some of the, um, bullshit you know that that exists in our society in other words if bloomington were able to become independent from all the things that we've been talking about and for that reason we wanted to found something i don't know exactly what it would be maybe we call it the bloomington independence network which would just be a oh i don't know some kind of loose touchstone a place a way for people to make contact with one another as they as they work to um establish the necessary organizations that would allow us to achieve independence as a community and break free from the uh, rigid capitalist bullshit that yeah as jay says yeah. the rigid capitalist bullshit the That's um around. yeah yeah you know all the uh, stuff that we consume the stuff that we need um is produced you know, largely in places that are um far far away from bloomington well why not have it happen here just a thought. If you're interested in something like that, write to us at the address that you're seeing on your screen. And if you are doing something, anything really, that has uh, some kind of bearing, if you're working in some way to make Bloomington uh, independent, then we'll gladly give you some kind of media coverage so that other people can know what's going on, perhaps become involved, uh, or well, who knows what. Let's, we just like to try to explore the potential that exists here in um, access television or whatever it is actually that you're watching
so Noam Chomsky, who the fuck is that, you may be wondering. Well, he's this guy, he's written a bunch of books. Um, one of them was called Necessary Illusions. Um, another one was called, what? Manufacturing, Manufacturing Consent. Consent. Um, there was a movie, actually, that was in the Ryder Festival, which comes through Bloomington sometimes, uh, called Manufacturing Consent, Noam Chomsky and the Media. Um, and it was about him. And actually, we found something interesting out about that movie and Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky has, in fact, never seen that movie. And uh, we asked him about that. Yeah. I mean, I didn't refuse mm -hmm. to let them film me, but it gives them a lot of pressure. I mean, you know, if they film me giving talks all over the world, let's say, I mean, it looks as if I'm doing something, but I'm not reacting to other people who are doing something. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the same usual fraud of the mm -hmm. history of the great leader. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 I know that they tried to overcome that because they were aware of it, but it's in here in the media. Just giving people the wrong idea. Making them take somebody else's business. That's a good point.